welcome to Book Lust. I'm Nancy Pearl. My guest today at University Bookstore is novelist Mary Doria Russell. Mary, it's great to have you here. Thank you. I'm so pleased to be back. So we, you and I have have taught. We've done interviews ever since. I mean, I we feel have like a history. we have a history, <laughs> and I feel like I was there right at the beginning of your career. You were, you were yeah. um, and which makes me very happy and very proud. So. Um, I was thinking back on those other times that we talked and mm -hmm. things that that came up, and I so I, I kind of like to reprise some of that All if right. you don't mind. Okay. So your first novel was The Sparrow, right? And how did that come about? <laughs> With great difficulty. <laughs> I mean, it, it, this is a novel that can be summed up as Jesuits in space. All right. And no one is more surprised than I that we were coming up on a 20th anniversary edition, edition of, of The Sparrow. Yeah, right. who would have thunk that <laughs> Jesuits in Space would A, ever get published, or B, stay on the shelves year after year right. after year, and B, coming up for an anniversary like that. <laughs> and, and so popular with book groups. It is. It, so yeah. I remember that that you, when before you started writing this, you were teaching at Case Western Reserve? Yes. In the anthropology School department. of dentistry. School of dentistry, yeah. But, I, my, my degree is anthropology, um, but it was biological anthropology, and my specialty was uh, craniofacial biomechanics. Okay. Wow. Yeah. Uh, and so I taught at the Case Western Reserve University School of Dentistry uh -huh. because it was head and neck anatomy. Yeah. See? So wow. there is a certain logic to my bizarre background. But then you took that, so, but my, my, remember, my memory of that is that then you were laid off or they, 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 they closed, they yeah. ended um, that. Right, um, the, the department was downsized out of existence. Yeah. Uh, and they decided that they would um, take all of the basic sciences courses from the dental school and fold them into the medical school, uh. right? So all the dental students still take gross anatomy and biochem uh -huh. and you know all that all that basic stuff but they take it in the medical yeah. school so but you so had, I didn't actually lose my job no no I, sorry. I know sorry. right where it sorry. is <laughs> it's in the in medical, medical school, school. somebody right. else is doing it now <laughs> yes but look with that look yes <laughs> well, I, I, there's a you know living in, well in, is in, the best revenge exactly <laughs> exactly so um but you had always been a big science fiction fan I it was my genre of choice for uh -huh. many years um, and uh, it was the, the, the genre that I was most familiar with, the kind of the structure and the expectations of, of a novel. Um, on the other hand, uh, I was picking out like the horriest of tropes. Uh -huh. I, see, you know, when I started this as a, as a craniofacial biomechanics expert, <laughs> Who trope knew? was Who not in your trope? vocabulary. Who knew the word trope? Yeah, right. I've learned all right. these things since right. then. Um, but yeah, I was really familiar with that. And um, I had this idea for what I thought was going to be a short story. Okay, kind of got away from me. Um, but it was, it was uh, 1992, and it was the 500th anniversary of Columbus landing in the New World. Right? Oh. Okay? Yeah. And all of a sudden, everybody was like dumping on Columbus. Like he left Spain saying, let's go depopulate a couple of continents, and then we can invite over a bunch of immigrants and we'll make cars. <laughs> you know, the guy thought he was going to Japan. Right. right. Uh, he, he cut him some slack was my attitude. <laughs> uh, it, yes, it got very ugly very fast. But um, it, we, he had no idea how and why he was different from the people that he and his sailors were meeting. Mm -hmm. And, you know, sailors. Right. Come on. Uh, you're, you're asking a lot. To, to get them to be good ambassadors for, the, for, for Europe. Anyway, um, my idea was to put modern, intelligent, well-meaning, well-educated people into the same position of radical ignorance mm -hmm. that the early explorers and missionaries and, and settlers experienced here in what we are pleased to call the New World. Um, and let's just see how well we would do. Uh -huh. Now, it had to be science fiction. It had to be first contact science fiction because there simply isn't any place left on the planet where we right. can be that ignorant. Right, right. Okay? Yeah. So that's kind of just, and I thought, you know, 11, 12 pages and I'll crap out. <laughs> it just kept pulling me along. 
So. And was it Father Sandoz that, yes. that did that to you? Father it Sandoz, was, the hero? Yeah. Well, the, the main character, certainly, the central character. Um, he's nobody's hero. You know, he really, this, people try to make him into more than he was. Like, oh, he was a martyr. No, 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 no. He was doing the best he could in a really tough situation. But, um, no, the whole situation of the characters and uh, also the actual experience of writing something. Because here I am, I'm, I was like 42 years old. I had never written fiction. Um, okay, grant proposals. Yeah, right, that's pretty fictional. Yeah, everybody, <laughs> everybody writes fiction right. at some point if you're a scientist. But um, uh, just making dialogue, um, finding out what it was like to create a scene, to um, go back over it and sharpen the dialogue, and then knowing uh, when you should pause, because the, co the conversations will pause. And then you'll become aware suddenly of things that are around you. Uh -huh. So, you know, five or six uh, uh, lines of dialogue, and then where are we? What are we hearing? What are we smelling? Uh, that was really fascinating to me. I had always been a passionate reader, I had never wanted to write. Mm -hmm. I wasn't one of those kids, you know, I want to write when I grow up. Right. I wanted to be an anthropologist and yeah. that's actually what I was for 20 years. So when you finished the book, you had an agent. But <laughs> Okay, tell us all. Okay, no, I so didn't have an agent. Um, it was turned down 31 times by 31 different agents. Um, it, try writing a query letter for a book oh. that's about Jesuits yes. in space. Right, okay, right. and as uh, uh, um, uh, one person told me, look, it is not just science fiction. It's science fiction about religion. Right, <laughs> right. <laughs> but what she also told me, this was um, uh, Mary Fiore, who was the managing editor of Good Housekeeping magazine for many uh -huh. years. And she told me, it, it, this is going to be really tough to place. Mm -hmm. You're going to need a really scrappy, really smart agent and with a lot of good contacts. But if it, if it gets published, it's going to win a lot of awards. Mm -hmm. And God bless her. Yeah, it, that's exactly what happened. Yeah, Jane Distel is my agent, and she has been from, from the get-go. And even Jane took 11 months to decide that really? she would do this. Yes. Really? She, you know, her first reaction was, I don't do science fiction. Uh -huh. <sighs> so ultimately through this whole convoluted, baroque series of un, and irreproducible results, as we say in the biz, in, in science, um, uh, she ended up taking it, taking me on as mm -hmm. a client. And mm -hmm. uh, eight days later, we had a hardcover, softcover contract with Random House. Wow. You know, with Villard, so it was yeah. really, it was amazing. And you had a really great editor there. Yes, Leona Nevler, a right. blessed memory. Yes. Oh, how I miss Leona. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I remember talking to her about it. And she was phenomenal. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, she was. She saw what other people didn't see, and she also had this sense of there are books that can do very well that that don't summarize well, that don't have a good elevator right. pitch. Right. You know, like Neanderthal Girl Raised by Cro Magnons. Oh, yeah. that's going to be a hit. <laughs> you know, but it was Clan of the Cave Bears. Right. It was huge. Right. Uh, so she was used to the idea that you could have things that, that would sound kind of stupid when summed up in a sen sentence and that were actually quite quite good and did well for the, for the company. Yeah, I'll say. <laughs> so, did, so when you finished The Sparrow, did you, did you know that there would be a sequel? No, no. So was it, was it because everybody wrote to you and said what happened no, next? No, 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 this was still, I was, I was 23 chapters into the sequel before I had an really? agent for the first book. So I was still wow, getting you, turned down. Wow. I would send what a out. lot of faith you oh, have. You know, here's the thing of it. it <laughs> there is a fine line between admirable persistence and being a complete blockhead. Yeah. And if anybody else had told me um, that they had been turned down by 31 agents, I'd be like, hello. Yeah. There's a message you're not getting. Right, right. Um, but there was just enough um, feedback from people who weren't, you know, like, my relatives or my friends, <laughs> who didn't have to be nice, uh, that was saying, no, keep going. Uh -huh. That I just kept working my way through the agencies. And uh, as it turned out, Jane was one of the f among one of the first agents that I was Queer. in touch with. She was part of, a, uh, of an agency uh -huh. that was very early on in, in, in my attempts. And um, it got carried 
out of that, that that agency imploded and split apart and you know it was and somebody took the manuscript with them gave it to somebody else and this is what i mean about yeah. a bizarre sequence right. of, of irreproducible but i like results. baroque i yeah, like very baroque, baroque is, is very it. baroque yeah so are you always such a, you don't strike me as being um an optimist <laughs> world's most cheerful pessimist. Yeah. 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 Exactly. So how did you keep going? Well, uh, it was not easy. Yeah. I mean, there was a time, you wouldn't know it to look at me now, but I was drinking like gravy to stay in triple digits for my weight. You know? Wow. <laughs> this is this is 20 years ago, of course. Um, but uh, yeah, it was very hard. And I would walk into a bookstore and I would look around and I would see all these books and I was thinking, well, he has an agent and She's got an agent, and that's terrible. And he's got an agent. Yeah. Is my stuff worse than terrible? Yeah. That it was. It was really very hard. And I did get to the point where it was almost impossible for me to walk into a library or a, or a bookstore without getting really depressed. Yeah, right. Um, but I kept uh, working on the, the the manuscript, and I did have um, some uh, encouragement from Miriam Goderich, who was the fiction specialist within Jane's. Mm -hmm. She's not a partner, but she was the fiction fiction specialist at the time. And she said, uh, you need to take about 50 pages out of the front end mm -hmm. and take every single word out of it that you can, wring it dry, because it was a big pile of papers. Mm -hmm. It was way over, I, I tend to way overwrite, uh -huh. and then I go at it with a chainsaw, because right. I know now that I overwrite and I know I gotta take it down. Um, but uh, I was not aware of that at the time. She kept telling me, no, take less, take less. And she said, you would think that people in in publishing would really look forward to a big chewy right. novel with a but instead they say oh my god I'll never get through that I don't have time for that uh -huh. so she said get get it done so I actually changed the margins by like I added one extra letter here and one <laughs> extra letter there I was doing just oh, you know you know there are standards right. for how big that should be I cheated those a little <laughs> I took everything out I mean I cut gee probably 40,000 words out of the original wow. yeah wow yeah easy and yeah. Easy. And I still do. I mean, yeah. I still will take 30,000, 40,000 out of a manuscript. Wow. I mean, because it's not a thick book. It isn't now. You know, <laughs> right, right, right. But I mean, I mean, it's not, you know, a novella by any means. Sure, yeah. But to think of that. So, so do you feel like Children of God is the sequel? Yes. And do you feel that that completes the story? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, I do get, I get email at least once a week saying, yes. will there be a trilogy? And I'm thinking, well, first of all, I haven't read this since 1998, so I know it's fresh in your mind, but right. I'm like so done with that boyfriend, yeah. you know? Yeah, right. I, do, I have learned over the last 20 years that I tend to work in pairs. So there were the two science fiction, right. Sparrow and Children of God, there were two 20th century historicals, right. uh, one about the, the, the end of World War I and the, and the beginning of the model, modern Middle East, that was Dreamers of the Day, right. and also uh, A Thread of Grace, which is about Jewish survival in Nazi-occupied Italy. So those two are a pair. Right. And then I've just written two Westerns, Doc and Epitaph, about Doc Holliday and Wyatt Earp. And I am moving on. I tend to be um, attracted to, to those I feel are unfairly maligned. Mm -hmm. And right now, my politics are such that I think that unions have been unfairly maligned. They're being, they're being uh, dumped on for a lot of stuff that they are not responsible for. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, I'm going with my, the, the one I'm working on right now is about the 1913 copper strike in Calumet, Michigan. Oh. My my yeah. stomping grounds. Uh, oh really? I mean, okay, Michigan, so you're in yeah, Michigan okay, anyway. All right, all right. At a big so, labor state. Yeah, <laughs> yes, exactly. And yeah. this was a, a really dramatic moment in early um, uh, union history, and I think it's it's a terrific story. Mm -hmm. um, and I might do Jimmy Hoffa oh. for the next one. Oh, you know? Do you have theories about I don't where yet. he is? I don't yet. <laughs> where his body my, my husband is. and I. This this is being uh, recorded on uh, July sixth. But on, on July 4th, my husband and I were lying in bed listening to all of the, the fireworks go off all around us. And Don says, you know, you could shoot somebody on July 4th and nobody would, <laughs> even, even if you called in, I heard a shot. The, right. the cops had completely ignored, ignored that. You. And I went, hmm, I could do something with that. So, yeah, I, I haven't even begun to look into Jimmy Hoffa's mm -hmm. life, but um, I am interested in how do you go from the you know the the very um, early days of idealism yes. and solidarity and all that to the point where you have 
you know, true, true corruption. There's a wonderful novel um, called Industrial Valley that's set in Akron. Oh, in your part of yeah, the, the I world, just not far Cleveland. From you. Yeah. Yes, and it's about, among other things, the first sit-down strike in the tire industry. Oh, you should try to. Okay. It's by well, it's, it's by it's Ruth McKenney. But I it was written. Never in, go near fiction that's about my own topic. Really, because yeah. it was. But it was written in the nineteen. 40s, I think, or okay, 50s, that, that a might long make the cut. time ago. I really ago. do try to avoid yeah. anything. Yeah, that's what I wanted to ask yeah. you about. So, so do you feel that avoiding fiction about your topic because you don't want that point of view of the other author to seep in? Or yeah, yeah. I want to be able to say honestly. I mean, one of the things that always came up with with the Sparrow was um, uh, c comparisons to James James Blish. Uh huh. Uh, yeah. I just case, uh, case of conscience. Mm -hmm. Okay, and because he has a Jesuit in space. Okay, and I had clearly I'm not real familiar with it, and I had never read it before, and, and then I looked it up, and I realized it was published when I was eight. Uh huh. Right. Was not into science fiction at eight. I was still reading horse books, you know, Black Beauty, that kind of thing. Um, and I like to be able to say if there's anything that indicates that that uh, I want to be able to say it was convergent evolution. Yeah, because as an ex-academic, I'm really, I'm really chary of anything right. that, that smacks of um, uh, plagiarism. Yeah. So I'm yes. pretty careful about not going to, to novels. I, you know, so I will make a, a, an exception. I'll read like one benchmark book. So mm -hmm. before I started writing um, The Sparrow, I read, I reread Left Hand of Darkness by uh -huh. Ursula Le Guin. Right. Because I was like, okay, here's, this is the benchmark. This is the right. good stuff. Uh, I read Lonesome Dove before I started Doc, uh -huh. uh, but I try not to read anything that's directly involved. I made an exception while writing Doc, and reread Gone with the Wind, because Doc Holliday and Margaret Mitch uh, Mitchell shared the Catholic sides of their families. They were second cousins. Oh, really? And so it's the scandalous Catholic wow. sides of both families. Wow. They, yeah. yeah, exactly. So when you read Gone with the Wind and you know Doc Holliday's real life. There are all kinds of echoes. You, you just get a real sense wow, cool, of cool. what he grew up in. Yeah. So how did you discover that? Um, there is a, a, a biography uh, written by um, Karen Holiday Tanner called uh, uh, Doc Holiday: A Family Portrait. Oh. And she is the great-great-grandniece. And so she had uh, access to family papers and memoirs written by her own family and, and uh, her own genealogy. Um, that no other biographer has ever been able to look at. So this, that for me was the gold standard biography. Uh -huh. um, everything else, they did their best, but she was the one who um, revealed for the first time that Doc Holliday was born with a cleft palate and a cleft lip. Now, oh, this yeah. is something the family has kept quiet for generations right. because this is a Southern family that really believed in good breeding, uh -huh. right? A, a cleft palate and a cleft lip, if that had gotten out, nobody yeah. would have married into the family again. So they had to be very, very quiet about this. As it happened, Doc Holliday's uncle, his father's brother, was the first, did the first cleft palate surgery in North America. John Stiles Holliday was a surgeon who did this. So I mean, it's, it's, it, once you know that and you know that his mother invented speech therapy, I mean, it's, it, it's an amazing family. Yeah. So yeah, that's how I got started on when that. When you were doing the histories, when you were doing Dreamers of the Day and mm -hmm. a, a Thread of Grace, what was the benchmark book that you, that you what was the historical, do you think? Well, for, for uh, A Thread of Grace, um, that was one of those things where I, I walked into a bookstore, I was on um, tour for Children of God, the sequel right. to The Sparrow, so that was number two. Um, and I saw this book called um, Benevolence and Betrayal, Five Italian Jewish Families Under Fascism. Okay, it's by Alexander Stile, S-T-I-L-L-E. I'm afraid it's out of print, uh -huh. but it, it's, it's still available if you, if you hunt. And I had just um, made a mixed marriage after 23 years by converting to Judaism, and my husband is not a Jew. Uh, and um, I and I, I looked at this thing, and I'm of Italian heritage, so I'm thinking, no, don't say you're of Italian. Is no, that not no, no, is this a big, yeah. <laughs> Can you tell? <laughs> um, and I thought Italian Jews. I didn't know there were Italian Jews. Mm. Like I thought I was the only one. So um, I, I took that 
I bought that, you know, it squirreled it away. And, and I got to this section called the priest, um, the priest, the rabbi, uh, the rabbi, the priest, and the aviator, okay? Mm -hmm. Which is like a setup for a joke, right? right? Yeah, the priest, yeah, the right, rabbi, right. and the aviator go into a bar, that, you know. Yeah. Um, and it was so dramatic and it was so fascinating. And everything I was reading as I read that book was like a revelation on every, you know, and I, I gotta do something with this. I, Got to do something with this, and that became the um, the impetus for a thread of grace. So, you told me a story um, when we talked about a thread of grace all those years ago, and that was how you decided how you worked out who would live and who would die. Oh my God! And yeah. I would like to get that down on um, <laughs> on video. Yeah. I guess it's not video. Tape, okay, but. here's the here's the thing about writing a Holocaust novel about Italy. Eighty five percent. It's hard to get exact figures, but we think 85% of the Jews of Italy survived, survived the Holocaust. Okay, now this is the exact opposite right. of every other occupied country. Italy was an ally of Germany for three years. It had its own anti-Semitic race laws. Uh, the Pope is famous for having kept his silence. And yet, the clergy, the peasants, the, everybody, stepped everybody up. stepped up. And yeah. they saved 43,000 of the approximately 50,000 Jews mm -hmm. who were in Italy when the Nazi occupation began mm -hmm. in 1943. Um, when you're writing about this topic, peop it's human nature. If you are not Jewish, you identify with the rescuers because you want to believe that you would do that the you same. Would, you would have done the same, right. right? And if you are Jewish, you want to believe you'd have made it through. Yeah that you'd have survived. That's what you're inviting. So I was inviting people to do that. And while I was writing A Thread of Grace, the movie, um, It's a Beautiful, or, uh, yes, a beautiful, a beautiful life, life with Roberto Bignini. Right. And he's very funny, but I hated that movie. I just hated it. Hate hate that movie. Um, because we know, I mean, I bought it right up until the wife demands to get on the train with her, wife, with her husband and child who are going to Auschwitz, which is where the, yeah. where the, the 7,000 the who, who were deporting, who were deported from Italy would go. And here's this guy and he like, he hides his child in a pile of coats. First of all, no, the kid would have been immediately, that kid would have been dead inside 45 minutes. Yeah. And it invites people to believe that if they'd been clever enough, if they loved their child enough. If they'd you been know, good enough. If they'd been good enough and right. all that. Uh, right. So. And the answer is no, yeah. no. Uh, a, a, a million and a quarter Jewish children died in those camps yeah. and their parents loved them right. and their parents were clever too. So it just infuriates me. Um, so I had to like lean in the other way and I wanted people to identify with the, both the rescuers and, and the Jews who were being hidden and buy into the decisions that they were making and then live out what that would mean for them. So my son, I, I was complaining about this. I'm, I'm, I'm writing a feel-good Holocaust novel. This is terrible. I can't do it. And my son said, well, you've got to kill Claudette. She was this 14-year-old girl. And I went, I can't. She's like, she's the backbone character. I know right. where I'm ending up, and she's going to be there. He says, OK, we're going to make a list of all your characters. And when we get home, we're going to flip a coin. Heads they live, tails they die. And we did. <laughs> Which, as I always tell people when I'm like talking about the book or leading a book discussion on it, is not so different. That randomness is not so different. It was ex from yes, from reality. From Everybody reality. that I talk to, any any combat veteran right. will tell you, uh, uh, any of the survivors that I interviewed, people yeah. said over and over, it was dumb luck. Right. You turn to your left and the bullet went to your yeah. right, and it right. was that close. Right. Um, so yeah. I was taking into account the, 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 the genuine element of chance on who lived and who died. Yeah. Now, you did cheat on one I character, one. And, and that was because... It would have been too sentimental otherwise, uh -huh. yeah. And I didn't want to give anybody a pass. Uh -huh. yeah. There was one that came out and I, oh, that would have been one. No. Yeah. No, that would. Uh, yeah. mm -hmm. It would have taken away some of the, the guts of the yes. of the book. Yeah. And the, yeah. and the sense that you're yeah. you're doing oh. that. So um, just um, we don't have a lot of time, but just quickly, <laughs> Gertrude Bell. Gertrude Bell. You love her. <laughs> I was not a fan. Gertrude Bell is this great 
feminist icon. She basically invented Iraq. Yeah, totally. Okay. Uh, yeah, Dreamers of the Day is about the 1921 Cairo Peace Conference. All right. The, Which we have the, totally the, forgotten. The peace to end all. The peace the to peace, end all peace. The peace, or, yeah, yes, right. Instead of the war to end all wars, this right. was the peace to end all peace. Uh, that started when somebody said, if you could go back in history, where would you go and who would you, and I mm -hmm. said, I, you know, where I would go, I would go to the 1921 Cairo Conference. And I would sit down with Winston Churchill, Gertrude Bell, and T.E. Lawrence, and I would say, you're setting us up for a hundred years war. Yeah. You, are, you are destroying any chance of any peace by drawing, the, inventing these countries, which are, as we sit and speak, yes. tearing themselves to right. pieces, horrendous warfare going on. This is all something that was set up in 1921 in 11 days in Cairo in a right. fancy hotel. Yeah. So that became the germ of dreamers of the day, where I literally did let my character sit down at dinner with them. Yeah. <laughs> and she's this housewife from Cleveland, Ohio. She's not even a housewife. She's, mm -hmm. she's a spinster teacher from yes. Cleveland, Ohio, and she is 40 years old, and she expresses her opinions. Those two biographies that came out recently, <clears throat> or in the last few years, Queen about of the Desert Queen was of the one. Desert, yeah. Georgina Howell and yeah. Janet Wallach yeah. wrote another one. Mm -hmm. Were those? They were not available. Oh. Oh, they might have been just barely available. But um, I, I worked with um, all of these people who were my characters in that one. They're all massively documented, and right. they were letter writers. Yes, right. Because Brits at the turn of that century right. were sure of their place in the world. Right. It was the, their empire, we just live in it. Um, and, uh, and they all wrote letters about what they were doing. They all had a sense of how historically important they were going to be. Uh -huh. So I worked from their letters. And uh, one of the things that let me know that I, that I had really nailed uh, Gertrude Bell in my own mind was that when she says something absolutely horrible to my 40-year-old school teacher from Cleveland, um, I was reading, I think, the biography that had come out uh -huh. while I was reading that, and, it, and, it, and she said that very thing to somebody else. <laughs> and I, went, I got you now. Yeah. <laughs> I know who you are. I have you, baby. Well, Mary, it's just been such a pleasure to <laughs> renew our friendship after several years of not getting to talk to no. you. I'm so happy that you came by today. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it.